Welcome back to Love and Responsibility LA, everyone. Uh, we are here as a community with the mission to form hearts and minds to love authentically, inspired by the teachings of John Paul II. We're so blessed today to have with us Father Augustino, CFR, and he's going to be talking about justice through the lens of love and responsibility. Hi, Father Augustino. How are you? Hello. Nice to, nice to see you, Jen. Nice to see everyone. God bless you all, wherever you're tuning in from. Awesome. Father, can you tell us a little bit before we get started about who you are, what you do, what God's leading you in? Sure thing. My name is Father Agustino Miguel Torres. I'm a Franciscan friar of the Renewal. We're based out of the Bronx in New York. I'm stationed in Patterson, New Jersey. And um, I'm assigned as an itinerant preacher, which means that preaching is kind of like my full-time job. And um, I'm very blessed to be able to uh, preach in a lot of different places, mostly to youth and young adults. Um, I co-founded a group of young adults called Corazon Puro, which focuses on bringing the dynamic teachings of the theology of the body to places of great need. So we were founded in the Bronx. We also bring it to like third world countries and developing nations and stuff like that, places where uh, there's a great need to know this, this amazing truth, uh, but it's difficult to get there. Um, and I helped to found also a couple of houses of discernment out east, and I'm super blessed to be able to serve as a priest of Jesus Christ, and uh, hearing confessions is my happy place. <laughs> is that good? Is that That's perfect, Father. Okay, yeah, perfect. we're so glad you're connecting to L.A. because we need it too. Um, let's start with prayer, Father, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your truth, Lord, and we thank you for Father Agostino. We just pray that you would bless his talk and the message. Pray that the Holy Spirit would be about him and that the words that he speaks would be from you. I pray that you would encourage and edify him and protect him in all those places that he needs, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit would just move um, in this message and in this talk. We pray for every person listening, every person who will listen, Lord God, that their hearts would be open and their minds would be open to you. We just uh, pray, Mama Mary, that you would guide um, this evening, that you would just um, surround us with your love and mercy. In your holy name, Jesus. Amen. All right, Father, go for it. Can't wait to hear about justice. And we'll come back, everybody. Um, we have a Q&A button. So just put your little questions in there when Father's talking and your mind starts, you know, chewing on things. Just put the question in and we'll have a Q&A after his talk. So thanks so much, Father. Got it. Uh, so my brothers and sisters, may the Lord give you his peace. Uh, I remember I was walking with a brother on 71st and York in Manhattan. We had just gone to the doctor. There's all these hospitals in that side of Manhattan. And um, I don't know. I was just like, okay, like picture the scene. Two guys dressed in Franciscan robes in New York City. There's trucks driving by. There was patients. There was doctors. And I'm just like, look, I got to take advantage of this. So I just started like blessing everybody i was just like hey 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 bro yo man god bless you and it's great to see the response in new york is like hey black god bless you too you know like hey thanks brother say a prayer for me like left and right you know like getting responses and and i and i saw on the on the corner of my eye this guy that was sitting down on 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 like the, the pavement and and i said hey hey bro hey bro how you doing man how's your day going and then he just kind of doesn't look up and he says, it's bad, man, it's bad. And I'm just like, whoa, whoa, we stop. We go up to him. Um, it's a guy, you know, we, we, we work with the homeless in New York and he had some of the makings of, you know, of, of somebody who hasn't had like a stable place to stay. And, and I started talking to him, asking him about things. He's like, what's going on? And he said, you know what, brother? Brother, I, I, I try. And it's kind of funny because like, uh, as soon as you guys were walking by, I was thinking, I've given up on love. I've given up because I tried. And he said, he wasn't talking about love as far as like a, a bad relationship. He was talking about just loving people. He said, I was the one that was going out and helping people. I was the one that was trying to bring goodness into the world and everyone just threw it back in my face. And when you guys were walking by, I was actually thinking of going up to that bridge right there and jumping off. So no, 
I'm not having a good day, this man said uh, in front of two Franciscan monks just so happened to be walking by. So I could not help myself, but I just said like, if it is not obvious to you that if you have given up on love, the Lord has not given up on you. What are the chances of two monks walking by in New York City the moment that you were thinking of jumping off a bridge? No, the Lord is trying to tell you something. He took it to thought. And then he said, well, you go out then. You go out and you tell them about what love really is. And I share that story to begin because I don't know how your year has been, where you are at, what's going through your mind, what sort of beliefs have been challenged, what sort of faith might have been lost, what sort of relationships might have been, been, been you know, kind of like thrown to bits with all the ongoings of this past year, my brothers and sisters. Let us talk about what love really means. Uh, this is from 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. Believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. If anybody needs like some Valentine's Day quotes, yo man, just read First John because he talks about love like all the time. I'm telling you, man, it's a gold mine. But, but, but all this is to say in this, in this curious um, subject, justice through the lens of love and responsibility, brothers and sisters, it all boils down to justice for the believer in Jesus Christ will always be influenced by love. We're gonna break down what that means. Okay, so first of all, what is justice? What is love and responsibility? I have no clue where you're tuning in from. I have no clue what your background is or what you think or what you don't think or what you try to think, but, um, but, but there's clear definitions of some of these things. So like, you know, justice will take it straight from love and responsibility uh, that, you know, justice pertains to things, material goods or also moral goods, that is a, a good name for the sake of persons. So it pertains to persons rather indirectly, says John Paul II in Love and Responsibility, whereas love pertains to persons immediately and directly. Let me break it down, okay? Uh, justice is um, what is owed to someone. But it's, a, it's more of a what question rather than a who question. Um, but there's other things that John Paul II said in some of his other writings about these things. And so he, he would say later on in Ecclesia in America, an incredible letter to read, very prescient, very prophetic. He says um, that the foundations of social justice rest on the threefold cornerstones of human dignity, solidarity, and subsidiarity. So this is like still what justice is, okay? Justice is what something is owed to somebody and why? Because they have a human dignity. And this solidarity in this, in this sense um, means that like, they uh, have a, a right to communion, to, to be long. Uh, uh, solidarity, a very deep word, uh, it says in the catechism is the most eminent of Christian virtues. Why? Because like, you know, when we um, come into some sort of communion, some sort of group, some sort of union with another person, we, we're really um, entering into like an image of God because God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, an eternal communion of divine persons. And so sometimes people ask like, well, what's heaven like? It's like, okay, are we gonna like, you know, jump around from cloud to cloud with loincloths and like grow wings. Is that heaven, you know, play a little harp? No, um, a theological way of, of explaining it is that we will enter in to the inner life of this divine communion. 
God will bring us in to his inner life without losing our identity. We will be so much part of the family of God. Uh, so this is an incredible dignity given to us by our Lord because he created us male and female. Sorry if I'm going a little quick, but there's a lot of stuff here. But our human dignity in love and responsibility is really um, explained by what's called the personalistic norm. The personalistic norm basically means that you cannot treat any human person like an object. They are always meant to be treated like a subject. Subsidiarity, for those who are interested, is that the decisions on the level that pertain to them should be kept at the level that pertain to them. So like, you know, uh, the government shouldn't be deciding what I'm having for dinner, so to speak. Um, and, uh, and, and that is a respect of our human freedom, of our human dignity. But back to human dignity, and now moving on to love and responsibility. So maybe some of you guys are here and saying like, what is love and responsibility? Like love has responsibility with great power comes great responsibility, right? Um, amen. Uh, but love and responsibility is a book written by uh, St. John Paul II when he was a professor in college, Karol Wojtyla, that was his name before he became Pope. Um, he wrote this incredible uh, book that, that it basically, uh, Love and responsibility is saying that, that justice demands that love respect the value of the other person rather than just using them to obtain pleasure. I mean, basically, I just summed up the entire book. You're welcome, okay? Um, but it's like, it's, it's justice that demands that, that I not treat any other human being as a means to my end. Now, granted, love and responsibility is going to be focusing specifically on the union of man and woman in marriage uh, because it has some specific, uh, you know, uh, areas of interest for him. Um, and there are some specific areas of interest for some of you guys too, I bet. Okay. Uh, but, but this is based on a justice. And in fact, in one of the sections in Love and Responsibility, he talks about justice owed to God. What justice is owed to God, he, he says in not so many words, is like, you know, marriage is like a justice owed to God. It's like, you know, when, when two people get married, it's like them honoring God. It's like them, like, you know, uh, responding to the goodness of God in their lives, through their bodies. But what he means by marriage is very deep, and I'm sure that's going to be covered by a lot of the other talks in this series. My job is to talk about justice through the lens of love and responsibility. Now, man, I could go on a whole bunch of different ways with this talk. And it feels like it should be a course, to be honest with you. It feels like it should be. Um, but for the sake of the time that has been allotted, um, I mean, we have to start with, with like just everything that's happened. You know, like, ah, one of my pet peeves is that sometimes in the church, we answer questions that nobody is asking. You know what I mean? I mean, pray for us. But, um, but what is happening in the world today? Well, I mean, I'm sure many of you are aware today, a, a, a verdict was handed down in the Derek Chauvin uh, trial, murder trial for George Floyd. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of, of, a, of, a, of a deep passion that many people have for social justice issues and, and so many of the social justice issues that have, that have risen up. And many of you guys see the injustices all around, the injustices uh, you name it, uh, you know, at the border, you know, in the international politics, you know, sometimes based on where you're from, what your last name is, the color of your skin, the, uh, the, the level of your education, you know, like all these injustices uh, should, uh, should provoke a response by believers, because believers in the Lord are, are, are you know, should want to remedy those things. 
but why is the question. So um, eh, sometimes we gotta do what's right, even when it's inconvenient because of the love of God. This is really the, 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 the crux of the question, but why do we pursue justice? Why do we seek justice? And how is that seen through the lens of love and responsibility is based on the love that Jesus has showed us. Our scripture, 1 John chapter 3, 24, uh, the commandment is that we believe in the name and love one another just as he commanded us. How did he command us to love? The love that Jesus asks of his followers is a radical love. It's a love that stretches. Like Mother Teresa said, it's a love that hurts. It's a love that inconveniences. It's a love that is wonderful. It's a love that has the power to change the world. And it has again and again in the life of any saint. History has been affected by the way that they have loved. And so this is how we're meant to love. So uh, I don't know if this really goes, but I remember I was in a, on a, on a red-eye flight back, back to New York from Orange County. And it was great because like I got a seat, there was a middle seat that was open. And I was like, great. You know, I say hi to the, to the girl in the window seat. She was like loving the window seat and I could not go to sleep. I'm just like, really? Like I'm really, I was so tired. I couldn't go to sleep. You ever have that? I'm like, what? This is ridiculous. So, so you know what I did to go to sleep? I started praying the rosary. Okay, judge me if you want. Okay, but it works. Um, and so, but it didn't work this time. Yo, I prayed three rosaries. And I was just like, God, really? Because like, oh my God, like three hours on this thing. And like, I only have like, you know, so much time left. And uh, I just couldn't sleep. And then, so I just started to pray. I said, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, is there someone that you, you want me to pray for? And man, it was really awkward, but I felt that I was supposed to pray for the woman right next to me. And I was just like, okay, let me pray for her over here. So I just started praying for her and just like, you know, started, you know, just like, and I, and I felt that, I felt that, that there was, that there was an incredible division in her home and that forgiveness was a need and that she had an incredible need and that God wanted to tell her that it was going to be taken care of. And I'm just like thinking, am I delusional right now? Because like, this doesn't make sense. Like, I was like, yo, God, she didn't think I'm creepy. Like, I'm like wearing this robe right? You know, I look like a gang member. It's dark. It's a, it's a flight. I mean, I don't need drama. Okay. And I just kept on feeling that like, okay. 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 So she wasn't sleeping neither. She was fidgeting around and, and I just like, oh, okay. <sighs> Looked over and I said, excuse me. I know this must sound crazy, but I'm just here praying. And I felt God, I felt like God wants you to know that the incredible problem that you're facing, he has a solution. And I was just thinking, okay, now it's gonna get ugly. And then she just started like looking, staring off into space saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, thank you, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. And then she was like, tell me her story. She said that, she said that she was diagnosed with cancer. And for one reason or another, she had to move back to New Jersey because her insurance uh, just refused to cover her treatments and she was not able to sleep because she didn't know what was gonna happen. And then, and then when she told me that, I was like, well, the Lord, the Lord says uh, that he's gonna take care of everything. And I was just like thinking, you know, love, love inconveniences. And I don't know, you know, I, I do know one thing, that that was important for this lover of Jesus to hear. This, this girl who was in a difficult place needed to experience that love. 
So this is the love that we are challenged, not just like randomly speak to women on red eye flights, but um, to, to love radically in this world because Jesus shows us love. All right, now, so this is distinct from different types of justice or uh, narratives that say justice is for X, Y, and Z. Like there are so many partisan politic rhetoric narratives, blah, blah, blah going on. And it's divided families, it's divided marriages. It's, it's caused people to, 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 to really doubt their own faith, asking like, where's the church and all this and, and really debunking something that they were raised with for something that is relatively unknown. Many people feel that if you don't say certain phrases, then, then you can't be trusted. Or even worse, that if you can't say certain jingles, certain phrases that define various movements, then you are an enemy. Now, um, all this needs to be informed with something that, that JP2 wrote to Henri de Lubac, a theologian back in the day who had a great influence during the Second Vatican Council, an amazing theologian, if you wanna try him out, you know, Henri de Lubac, he, he wrote a letter um, in uh, I think uh, 63, uh, saying that the evil in our times consists in the first place of a kind of degradation, indeed pulverization, of the fundamental uniqueness of each human person. Translation, like you name it, like what it tries to do, if, if it's trying to um, uh, degradate or pulverize the unique goodness of every human being, then we got a problem. We have what we call an insufficient anthropology, meaning like it's a view of the human person that's not complete. The oh man, we how does this play out? You can have all the money in the world, and it still won't save you. It still won't fill you. Uh, more money, more problems. Said a prophet from Brooklyn, and this is uh, a truth. You can apply it to anything, and so many of these ideologies that are looking for social change are, you know, in some way, shape or form, what John Paul II says in Love and Responsibility. So far we have explicated one thing, namely that the love of the person must consist in affirming his supra material and supra consumer value. What does this mean? It means that the love of the human person is more than just the material. It's more than just their purpose. So many things are, are just relegating humanity to the material, to what they are, to what they consume or what they don't consume or what they shouldn't consume or, or who they should be with or, or, or how, what their sexual orientation is. And when, when you just define people by that lens, you are limiting them. And it's not a full picture of their entirety, of their full human dignity. And he goes on, whoever loves will attempt to show this in his entire conduct. And there is no doubt that, that this way he will also be just toward the person as such. So what does that mean? It's like, look, man, if you're, if you're really trying to love with responsibility, you're not gonna just be good to your significant other. So many relationships, they become myopic. It's just like, it's all about, oh my gosh, he's so awesome. Oh my gosh, he's so wonderful. And all you think about is, 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 is like serving that person. That's not a bad thing, but it becomes a bad thing if it's an end in itself. If that's all you're doing, then you need to check yourself. And so like, um, I want to just bring a couple of thoughts because uh, this question of justice through the lens of love and responsibility can help us to see the direction of the relationships. 
that we may or may not be in. Um, and so with just with the few minutes I have left, um, I'm gonna give a couple just like, mm, I don't know, examination of conscious, couple like, you know, questions to see how your relationship is going and then a couple tips on being able to uh, be just according to the lens of love and responsibility. So in your relationships, does your significant other often cut corners, cut lines, cheat others and take pleasure in it? Yeah, you know, there's something really cool about finding like $5 bills, like, hey, all right, you know, finders keepers, right? I guess, okay, it's like one thing, I don't know. Some people say it's stealing. Some people like we call it providence. Um, you know, you could talk to your confessor about that. Um, but but there's some people who absolutely delight in cutting corners. It's like it makes them kind of like he got one on someone. And and I, I just gotta say, if that's if that's a, a, a preeminent. Uh, characterization of your significant other, and they're not living justly. Justice, give to, to, to someone what is owed to them. If you see a wallet on the floor and, and you saw it fall from the guy's pocket and you don't say, hey, sir, you dropped your wallet. Um, you know, that's, that's owed to him, that belongs to him. Ultimately, on some level, this is thievery. And if this is, is a, an operative, op operative um, component of, of someone's uh, conscious, then, then, then this is a problem in a relationship. Number two, have you ever seen your significant other help someone out who could in no way pay them back or allow their schedule to be completely destroyed because they were helping this other person? Um, it's one thing to bring flowers. It's one thing to, to, to remember birthdays and stuff like that. That's great. Uh, but is, is the person that you're in a relationship with, have you ever seen them do good to someone just because they were in need? And not even because somebody was looking. I just did this wedding a couple months ago. And I was, I was asked, I like to ask the couples like, you know, like, so how did you guys meet? So when did you know? So how did you fall in love? It's great material for the homily and the weddings. Anyway, um, uh, this young woman, they met when they were on mission in Africa. Oof, yeah, if you wanna get married, go on to mission in Africa. Um, and, uh, and she said that she began to fall in love with him because she saw him serving the orphans in just like this disinterested way. So it's not about him. And she was just like, wow, that's like such a beautiful thing. And he was, he was handsome, of course. He was like, you know, like, you know, tall. Anyway, 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 all the other stuff was there too. But, um, but this is an important thing to, to, to look for. So have you ever seen your significant other help someone out when they could pay them back in no way and not because they were trying to impress you? And number three, is your relationship only one way? And are you just at the point of exhaustion in giving everything without anything in return? If this is the case, then, um, then this relationship is unjust because justice demands that in a relationship that there be reciprocity, that there's a give and take, it's a two-way street. It's, it's you give, but you're also received and, and you receive because you give, this is the nature of a relationship. And it's just to, to, to ask this tenderness and intimacy, John Paul II teaches in Love and Responsibility is part and parcel with, with, with human interaction. Uh, and it's not about sex. If you're reading the book, Love and Responsibility, you know tenderness and intimacy is not a sexual act. It is a, a gift of, of oneself, a sharing of one's internal life. And this is necessary for a, a real relationship. So are those three things happening? You know, ask yourself. But these are three tips to finish up um, and how we can live justice through the lens of love and responsibility. Practice number one, 
Practice loving by serving only for the love of Jesus. So, okay, you go help the homeless out. You go to the soup kitchen, you, you pack um, bags that are gonna go to the Philippines that just got hit by a typhoon, amen, amen. Are you doing it because it feels good? Because it feels good, it feels good for a little bit. <laughs> Do that for your entire life and it's gonna hurt. Um, but are you doing it just because it feels good or you wanna feel good about yourself? Practice doing it solely for the love of Christ. How do you do that? Just like say a prayer like, Lord, may this be for your glory and not for my glory. And then just go do it. You're not going to be perfect. I mean, look, man, if you're doing 51% for the Lord, you're doing great. You're doing great. Okay, so you've got to work on the percentage. You know, like this is like 40, Jesus, 60, me. You're on the right track. Try to get to 51 because, you know, on this side of heaven, we're always going to have mixed motives. Number two, uh, in relationships with others, seek not to honor yourself, but to honor the other. Seek not to please yourself, but to serve the other. Seek not your own gain, but seek to give for another. Repeat. In your relationships, I mean everything, like your friendships, you know, your marriage, obviously, you know, your relationship with your kids. This is the message of the gospel right here, summed up in this cool little poetic thing I just put together. Seek not to honor yourself, but to honor the other person. Seek not to please yourself, but to serve the other person. Seek not self gain, but seek to give to the other person. You think you're like, well, there's not going to be anything left for me. It's like, the, the, the way this works is the more you give to somebody, the more you receive, the more you get. It's not like a bank account. It's about grace. That's number two. Number three, practice tender, tenderness that is disciplined to avoid sensuality. Okay, so uh, like we want to live this justice according to love and responsibility and there's like this tenderness that's necessary. He goes all into it in, 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 in the book, but it has to be with a view of the good of the other person. So what happens is that a lot of times that tenderness leads to some sort of sensuality, meaning you're crossing the line a little bit and you're like, oh, well, you know, I love her, she loves me. Okay, um, practice tenderness that is disciplined to avoid sensuality, meaning, that like you care about the other person so much that it's not about you, nor is it about what you gain, nor is it even about how strong you feel, but it is about the good and the salvation of the other person. This is a real concrete way of living justice through the lens of love and responsibility. Brothers and sisters, I could go on, but I'm gonna leave it right there and see where the questions come from, see how the questions go. Thank you for listening to me, amen, amen. There's so much more that we can learn about this, but thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Father. It's a lot to like think about. <laughs> and we got, there's so much more, you're right. We should have a whole course on justice, you're right. Okay, so you ready to go into it? Get some questions going, all right. Number one, what are some ways, um, how do you discern what's just in certain situations? Um, a well-formed conscience is able to, to discern uh, what is just in certain situations, meaning um, that we never, two wrongs don't make right ever. Uh, and uh, this, some of the basic things to understand uh, in a, a moral act is has an object um, and a circumstance. Object, intention, circumstance, sorry. So a lot of times we think like, well, if my intention is okay, then, then, then it's okay. Well, I don't really mean to do bad, but it's like, no, no, like it is what it is, you know, like adultery is adultery like that, that is what it is like if it was the context was like well I was just a little tipsy so it's like no 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 it is what it is uh the object determines the morality of the act 
and then the intention and the circumstance just kind of mitigate culpability. So maybe you're not as culpable, but it still is what it is. So um, to, to, to look at something that's just, um, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas in the famous example, if you have two pieces of bread and your neighbor is starving, you don't have two pieces of bread. You have one because the other one belongs mm. to your neighbor. That's justice. Um, and so uh, this is what we need to do. We need to inform our consciences to, to be able to be um, a lot more nuanced in some of those tricky things. Uh, but the basics are the basics. Object, intention, circumstance, do good, avoid evil. And, uh, and that's how you'll be able to know what is just in tight circumstances. Yeah, I love that. You know, Father, it was funny because I was asking the Lord, like, I'd love to like love you, Lord, like especially with the poor, like and and give to you. And I remember there was like a tension in my heart. Anytime I'd be like so tired after being a principal, right? I would like go get my food. I was so hungry and I would walk out <laughs> and somebody would be like, May I have your food? And it was like when it wasn't from the excess, I was like struggling. You know what I mean? It was like he was teaching me or educating me like that true sense of love that you were talking about in tenderness. All right, we got another one. Serving selflessly seems to conflict with expecting reciprocity in a relationship. How can we serve selflessly while also making sure that there's reciprocity in the relationship? If both of you sel serve selflessly, then there's reciprocity. <laughs> I mean, seriously, because a lot of times it's one person and I'm just keeping it real. Yeah. A lot of relationships are one-way relationships, and that's not right. That's usually a sign of immaturity on the part of one person or another. Now, not everybody comes into a relationship perfect, ready to go, you know, just add water. No, um, it's, it's, there's a growth and maturation process that has to happen. So what I would say is like, you know, if you see a person growing in that sense of reciprocity, in that sense of, of you know, recognizing the needs of the other, um, then, then that's, then that's a good sign, but you have to see signs of growth. Yeah. Uh, a lot, sorry. A lot of times, especially the ladies, ladies love you, pray for you. Um, but, uh, it's like they keep on hoping beyond hope. And I don't know if that's from God. Mm. Um, I'm just saying, you know, fellas, yo, fellas, I love you fellas. But like, sometimes it's like, there is a cognitive block in some relationships for them to learn. But so when I interview a couple for marriage, I'm looking for this growth. I'm looking for this capability of learning, adapting, growing. And if it's not there, I'm like, mm, I don't know if you can come to the altar and make vows for the rest of your life. So I don't know if that helps, but like um, this self-service injustice deserves a reciprocity. It's like, you know, like um, uh, scripture says, do, uh, outdo one another in practicing charity. You know, so like if you do something for your, for your, uh, your significant other um, and, then, uh, and then they do something, you know, to, to show that, to echo that, uh, you know, mass, you know, the priest has his parts and then the, the people have their part. There's like this echo that's necessary. This is, this is, this is a, an image of our, of our relationship with God. God loves and this love is, is echoed back. We can't love like God does, but still we, in some way we say, um, Lord, I'm here, here I am. So sorry if that's a little confusing of an answer, um, but it, it, it does lead to some complicated possibilities, you know? Yeah, one of the other girls' question goes perfectly with this too. She said, if justice requires reciprocity, how do we help marriages that fall apart because of the lack of contribution of one spouse? Will separation be then justified for a lack of reciprocity or does justice require unconditional forbearance and patience? It's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's easy too because canon law allows for separation for mm. right and just reasons. Um, and the easiest one, the, the tragic, but, uh, but if, if, if someone's life is in danger, or someone's safety is in danger, um, then, then there is canonical separation. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there are times when someone should separate. 
Now, we, we should do everything we possibly can to protect the bond, uh, as, as it said, because I do feel that we live in a throwaway culture and so many people are ready to throw away their marriage and they don't give grace a chance. Mm. Um, and so uh, when you depend on yourself, your marriage is not gonna do well, but when you depend on God, and, and uh, I was just speaking to my sister about a marriage that like they both got COVID and they almost, they almost died. Mm -hmm. And so in the process, like it's like they recovered their marriage. They were on the verge of divorce mm -hmm. and they had to self-isolate with each other. <laughs> so it was kind of like crazy. It's like a movie. Yeah. Um, and, and through that, you know, they, uh, they, they almost got kissed by death and it was a wake up call for them to allow grace to re-enter in their marriage. Now they're holding hands, they're working on it. They're not perfect. They've, mm -hmm. they've, they've done so many things that have hurt one another, but they're willing now to let the Lord in more because it was, it was kind of like a, a marriage that was dying of neglect. And, and, and now they're kind of like putting water on parched earth and it's beginning to grow again. So it is possible, it is possible. Sometimes there are separations um, and uh, you, you need wise counsel to know the right thing to do in certain, certain circumstances. Yeah. Thanks, Father. Yeah, I love what you were talking about, justice demanding um, that love and respect and reciprocity. And also like JP2 talks about that equality. You know what I mean? With the common aim, like that puts you on the same footing. So it's beautiful. All right. This is our friend, William. Advice on purifying intention when meeting a woman as a single man. Ooh, brother, <laughs> sit in the front and keep your eyes on Jesus. <laughs> uh, how do you do that? Continue just to, to pray, to desire her salvation um, above any thought, any desire, any, anything of your own. Uh, desire her salvation. Pray for her good. And uh, when there's that, you know, oftentimes natural, uh, desire for other things, uh, sublimate it, you know, bring it to the Lord, like, Lord, I give you thanks even for this. And I, and I lay this desire down because what I want is her salvation and her good is, is what I would do. And it's a discipline. It, a discipline is something you do every day. You want to get in shape? You got to work at it. You want to have a pure heart? You have to work on it with grace always. Um, but it's, it's something that John Paul II says is calls a school of love. It's like you're learning how to love by sublimating these desires for the sake of the salvation of, of this person. Yeah, I love what you said about tenderness, Father, disciplining to avoid sensuality. And he talks about those spiritual tremors, right? Like we don't want to take away tenderness. Like you want tenderness in its fullest sense. Yeah, that's beautiful. I would tell William to pray to St. Joseph for virtue. <laughs> He will, he will grant that. Um, okay, Adam, how do you find the confidence to love radically in a culture of stranger danger? Mm. Mm. Uh, one thing we say in, our, in, in the friars is that um, love uh, and, you know, practice charity uh, to, the, to the point of knowing that that you're going to be taken advantage of and 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 don't you know don't flip your lid uh if you're ever taken advantage of um uh, obviously it should be it should be measured it should be prudent you know um I would never ask someone to to you know do something that's just like clearly against the virtue of prudence but um stranger danger uh you got to take a risk especially if you're a young man, a single man, uh, you're able to take risks that, that other people can't. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, for the danger sometimes for, for our, 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 our beautiful sisters that, that there exists if they're walking alone or something like that. But if you're a man, uh, you can take risks. And some of the best things as a friar I've seen when I take that risk. Um, is there a danger? Yes. Say a prayer, ask St. Michael to accompany you, and then love radically. One thing I've, I've learned is that there's there's a respect amongst the poor, the homeless, even the, 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 the somewhat emotionally unstable, 
with somebody who loves God radically. They respect. I could tell you a lot of stories about that, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll save it. Yeah, Father, can you like expand on that? Like, how does prudence and justice work together? Like, how does it? How's that interplay? Um, so they're both virtues. Justice is, you know, you practice justice. Uh, you give to others what is owed to them. Uh, and, and prudence is like you don't put yourself in a situation where, firstly, you would sin. You don't put yourself in a situation that you need not be in. Uh, so if, um, if I want to help a poor man down a dark alley by myself at three o'clock in the morning, prudence would tell me that that is not a wise thing to do. But if it's three o'clock in the morning in open space and there's people all around, then justice uh, would be kind of like, in other words, you gotta be street smart a little bit, you know? Like, yes, uh, serve the Lord. Uh, yes, uh, help those in need. Um, but, but, but know where you're at is, is a way that I would kind of like say it street, street wise in other respects, in, in other places, justice and prudence, um, uh, ultimately our role is to bring souls to heaven and, uh, and prudence, uh, it, it, it helps us practice justice, not with a thunderous hammer, but perhaps with with a um, with a with with a kind word, sometimes you know truth and justice uh, in some people's minds trumps uh, you know love and charity. Mm -hmm. Now this is an, an an ongoing battle. It's like you know prudence is able to kind of like know. It's like you know, this is this is a time for a a, a challenging word to mm -hmm. somebody. You know um, I don't know you know whatever the situation is, it's like, you know, uh, stop doing that stuff for the love of God. Uh, but also prudence is going to know when somebody needs mercy, somebody needs kind of just like uh, um, a, a listening ear. It's hard. So what I say is, say a prayer to the Holy Spirit, um, listen to a whole bunch of Fulton Machines talks, and you'll, you'll know what to do. Well, machine talks. I love them, but okay. Um, Father, I, yeah, I, I love what you're saying because I just feel like sometimes prudence, you want to know the true good and how to achieve it because sometimes you're doing something and it can really go be a mess because the way you did it, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, that's beautiful. And also the extremes that you're talking about, it does seem like there, there is, um, there's some kind of that, yeah, there's almost like a spirit there in the extremes where it's like there's not prudence and like love isn't presupposing justice. It's either injustice or justice instead of somehow living in the tension where Christ was. Okay, Katie, can one be unjust to oneself? Insofar as justice and the natural law is giving to someone what, what is owed to someone, Yes, you can be unjust to oneself. Um, and that said, uh, love inspires extremes. So an example, like sometimes like you, you read about the saints and like they stayed up all night praying. They like didn't need anything for years and stuff like that. And you're just like, oh man, it's like have a sandwich or something, you know? Um, but it's, it's, it's like this, this radical relationship with 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 Christ inspires and and you know for example in the life of Padre Pio always through obedience these sacrifices were taken on always through obedience so that is kind of like you know these things that might seem extreme privations to oneself that would normally go against justice is like you need to eat you know mm -hmm. um, through through obedience to his superiors, and he was like radically obedient, but also uh, sometimes it's like this, um, uh, this extraordinary spiritual phenomenon uh, happens. Translation, if you're Padre Pio, let me know, because I want to meet you, but most of us are not. So that means that we should fast like normal people, and uh, we should drink water, we should like, you know, not 
uh, deny ourselves in a way that's imprudent, always try to keep it with obedience to a confessor, to a spiritual director, uh, if there is ever anything that, that comes up, like, you know, sometimes some people are like, oh, I want to do this penance or something like that. Like, ah, why don't you check with somebody? Uh, because sometimes in our zeal, we can kind of like, you know, go beyond. On the other extreme, it sometimes feels like, like what is one, what one is owed becomes like an idol. And like, you know, self-care is not about what I need to live healthily. Self-care becomes a be-all and end-all. Mm. Um, and I know that's a touchy, touchy subject, you know, but, but like sometimes it becomes an idol and that's the other extreme, you know, uh, it's not what you're owed to the detriment of others, you know, it's, it's what you're owed so that you can love God, serve him in this world and in the next, you know, and so this is kind of how I would answer that question. That... Yeah. Okay. okay. Racial tension is so high right now. I find it hard to start a dialogue with someone without risking offending them. Any suggestions? Uh, establish a relationship. Yeah. You know, um, uh, you know, I think we, time, we tend to correct or bring up uh, a, a contrarian point of view without having established relationship. And um, sometimes we have to, because we have to represent the truth. We have to represent... Um, you know, uh, protect the, 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 that which needs to be protected, protect Jesus, you know, somebody's spouting off bad things, you know, I'm going to speak up. Um, but a lot of times we, we uh, correct out of relationship. And usually what I would say is that you have to focus on that relationship. You have to build that and then get, get to the point. Now, it doesn't mean like, you know, sometimes it's like, we have friends that are just like really completely at odds with what we believe. You know, it's like say, hey, look, man, I'm, I'm Catholic and I believe everything the Catholic church says, but you're my friend. And, um, and uh, I, I want you to know that, that you're still my friend. And then, and you'd be surprised at how shocking that is for some people, uh, who some people who would feel like, oh, well, you're Catholic, you're like that automatically means that, that, that you hate me, that you're condemning me to hell. Um, but uh, it's tricky because sometimes we have to speak up. It is a moral imperative to, to speak up when, some, when we are the representatives of, of the truth. So like an example is like you're in a group of friends and, um, and you know, somebody says like, oh, you know, like I'm going to go for an abortion tomorrow. And they kind of like, whatever. Uh, and you don't say anything like, oh, it's a moral imperative to go up to that person and say, hey, look, I know you said what you said. I may not know you very well, but please don't do it. You know, like I'll offer to help. Like that's, that, that is like, if we have an informed conscience, like we need to do something in those, in those, in those um, situations. It's hard, but we need to do something. Um, and there's a number, couple of other situations like that. But in a lot of these other things, it's like, you know, there's, there's just like what people think, how people are living, and there is space to build some sort of relationship in so far as you can. Uh, some other advice I give to people is like, look, you know, don't go out saving the world if you're not in a place of prayer, if you're not in a place where you're, where you're like solid because you could end up losing yourself. It's kind of like that lifeguard thing. Anyone trained to be a lifeguard? It's like they say, you jump in to save somebody, you better stay, keep your distance, give them the life, uh, the, the, the what is it called? Life raft? The, or the, the lifesaver. Oh, lifesaver, yeah. Give them the lifesaver because they could pull you down. Like I remember when I was training to be a lifeguard, I was like, no, don't do that. Don't get too close because people like, boom, yikes. Um, and so this is another important thing to, to know is like you have to be based in prayer. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Yeah, strive to. I, I, I strive to uh, have some relationship with people who think very differently than I do um, and think that it's just an ideological thing, but who still come to me to ask for prayer. Or what is it? Can you do whatever you do? Because like, you know, I'm going through this thing. I was like, you mean prayer? Yeah, I'll pray for you. Um, and, and then you'd be surprised. It could be five, 10 years down the line. Where, where they'll come to believe because, because they know you believe. Um, but anyway, that's kind of how I would answer that question. Nice. And that kind of leads into this other one. As a man, 
how does one approach the topic of pro-life and speaking out against abortion without being viewed as patriarchal or not rec res respecting women? Um, well, I think firstly, know that if you're gonna speak up for being pro-life, that's gonna be thrown at you. Um, uh, we go and pray in front of abortion clinics and let me tell you what, we are called every sort of thing under the sun and it hurts. It's like, man, I'm trying to help over here. Um, but receive it as, as Christ did. Think about it like, you know, him carrying his cross uh, to Calvary um, uh, for the sake of, uh, in reparation. Uh, know that, that they're gonna call you that. Do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Do it for the right reasons. If you are patriarchal, whatever they, they whatever that means for them, uh, strive to be converted of heart. Um, you know, uh, do it for the right reasons. I mean, this is life, and life must be protected. And we need men to stand up for these babies in the womb. We need men. So I uh, perish the thought that this isn't a man's realm or that only women can speak up about it because trust me, the women want us to speak about it. Isn't that right, Jan? And women are like, you know, like, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, and uh, and, it's, and it's, it's everybody's, it's everybody's uh, battle to fight. All of us are needed for this, um, for this epic battle for the innocent here in the womb. Yeah. Yeah, when people see a good father, that could be spiritual or biological. Like, I feel like the world is crying out for good fathers, you know? So I think that will put everything at ease. <laughs> um, how do you know if he or she is the one father? <laughs> Ooh, enough, I know. Yo, I'm going to write a book that's called Knowing If He or She is the One. Um, <laughs> uh, so just real quick. Uh, the, the 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 big answer it's like the way i speak to women about this is very different than the way i speak to men okay this is vanessa <laughs> oh, so from vanessa okay yeah so this is this is for the ladies um you deserve a man and not a boy uh some men are boys in men's bodies and hey you know i mean stuff happens you know they're their story is their story, and we pray that eventually that they'll reach a sufficient maturation point where they can enter into a lifelong committed relationship. Um, but understand that a man is willing to lay his life down for those whom he loves. And this is a huge indicator. If he is willing to sacrifice, uh, for those who he loves, not to sacrifice, like, I'll take a bullet for you. I mean, that's amazing. But like, you know, even sacrifice his own interests, uh, but also uh, lead, also uh, inspire, uh, someone who's brave and generous, uh, faithful. Um, he is uh, available and teachable. So what I tell ladies is look for someone who's big and fat. <laughs> brave inspiring generous faithful available and teachable mm -hmm. uh, bravery means that someone is like you know when when you have to be brave to stand up against what is wrong and this is something in the man that that is is clear if it's if it's all the same then that's that's not bravery it's cowardly on some on some respect uh, inspiring, does he inspire your faith in some way? Uh, generous, does he give of himself to others, like I was saying before, with others that, that can't really repay him, not just his own, uh, but, but does he, it, it, you know, is he in really generous? Uh, faithful, yes, religion is important. Yes, belief in God is important. And I know sometimes some situations are difficult and he doesn't believe or he's of another uh, denomination or something like that. But this faithfulness, this belief in God is something that is very important. Uh, um, availability. Um, if, 
if you spend time with those that you love and that availability factor in a man is very important because it shows that he's aware uh, and it shows the, the potentiality of, of entering into a relationship that's going to grow from, from, uh, from time spent and not wither from neglect mm -hmm. and teachable. Uh, not that you are the only one that's going to teach, although men learn a lot from their, from their girlfriends, fiance, wife, um, but uh, that he is capable of, of, of growing and learning, especially when exposed to the truth. Now, that sounds kind of bad. You know, I'm a guy, right? You know, but like sometimes some guys are just like, this is the way I am. You got to take me exactly the way I am. That's a problem, man. That's a problem. Because you have to be able to learn and grow in any relationship. That's what I would say to the women. Look for someone who's big fat. Yeah, that's great. You got your chapters already, Father. <laughs> 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 okay, what would you tell the man then, Father? For men, yeah. it's just two. It's, for men, it's scratch and sniff. Okay. Uh, look for a woman who is DR, not a woman who's Dominican Republic, although lots of wonderful women from DR, um, uh, devoted and receptive. Uh, devotion in a woman is a faith that inspires and, and is, it's almost like, it's like Our Lady on the donkey in Bethlehem. Mm. She was the spiritual strength that Joseph needed when he couldn't find a place he would turn back, this is my meditation, he would turn back to her and he would just see her holding baby Jesus in her womb. And he's like, I gotta do this. I'm gonna find a place. Like that devotion in a woman can, can, can lead a man to sanctity and holiness and prayer. Receptivity, men look for a woman who is receptive. And my definition is when she is uh, exposed to the truth, she allows, she's receptive to allowing that truth to inform her and to change her. Um, receptivity is so important. Uh, John Paul II says, you know, uh, Mary is the, is, the, is the archetype for humanity because of her receptivity to God. And the receptivity of the woman, although there's plenty of theology, the body, things I can go into with that, uh, is oh, an indicator is that when she hears the truth, she's like, that's right. And she begins to change. And you see the change. That's what I would tell guys. DR, devoted, receptive. Oh, you made me tear up. <laughs> the devotion part of there's something about Our Lady's grace that it it not only strengthens and edifies Joseph's virtue, but his virtue then like is this foundation and this safe place where her grace can just um, even magnify, you know? <sighs> okay, <laughs> gotta step out of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how do you know when God is calling you to persevere through a relationship? And how do you know when to end it? Mm, well, you know, um, I would refer you guys to uh, Jason Kristalina Everett's, Everett's um, list of, I think they call it the dump him uh, list. But, but ultimately, you know, sometimes those things are, are not as nuanced as, as is needed sometimes in, in a more mature relationship. Um, I would say that, um, that the indicators uh, are if, if like kind of like what I mentioned, you know, like, is, is this something that's just leading you to exhaustion? Is this a one way relationship now? Is this something you are giving everything and getting nothing? Um, that's an indicator. It's like, you can't live like that, you know, like bring, bring it to prayer, bring it to wise counsel. And um, ah, look, I'm Franciscan, okay? Uh, we are called to be saints. Um, and uh, ask yourself, is this relationship leading you to sanctity? Or is this relationship the very thing, the thing, the barrier to sanctity? Sometimes, you know, hey, man, stuff happens, you know, it's a little complicated, it's a little mixed. Okay, trying our best. Um, 
you know, just, just sliding in last. All right. But if it's the very thing that's keeping you from sanctity, leave, leave now. Are kind of like big picture indicators. Um, the hard stuff is like, man, these, it's like you, you're in a relationship and you see so much good in the person, but there's all these other things. And you're just like, ah, mm-hmm. ah so you got to enter into a discernment. Um, and there's no easy way of saying it. Like, you know, one way that people often say is like, do you see him being the father of your kids? Do you see her being the mother of your children? Uh, do you see um, yourselves living uh, a, a betrothed, uh, 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 truly, like John Paul II says, a relationship where, where you are uh, giving yourself to the other and the other is giving themselves to you for the sake of the salvation of the world. Now, sometimes that's a little bit like, kind of like, yeah, that doesn't really happen in everyday married life, but at least be aware of it, I would say, is an indicator of whether you should stay or, or, or leave there's hope for them growing in that, then that's an indicator that you should stay. If you can't see that happening at all, I think you have your answer. Awesome. Thanks, Father. Yeah. (laughs) Good questions. These are tough questions. I know. They're good though, right? Okay, let's keep going. There's a few more from Facebook Live. Thanks for joining everybody. Um, I've walked away from a relationship that was not going in the right direction. So some similar thing. How do you still help them when you know they need guidance? Um, You pray for them at a distance. Mm. Uh, Usually like 99 times out of 100, when you leave a relationship, you need to separate yourself from that relationship. Um, And it's, it's for the both of you. Because, man, there's, like, all these, like, you know, rerun relationships, you know, like, yeah, we were together, and then we broke up, and then we're together again, broke up, and it's like, yo, for the sake of both of you, like, mm-hmm. stop. Like, you know, because there's, it's obvious that it's, that it's, that it's not really going to work, and, but, like, sometimes that there's this, like, this emotional familiarity with the person that you're like, ah, you know, like, mm-hmm. let's try it again. Um, it's not healthy. Uh, In my opinion, it's not healthy. What I, what I would tell somebody is like, look, if you would ever get back with somebody, like they have to show over a a long period of time, clear patterns of change in those areas where you know that they needed to change, um, or grow in. Uh, so what I would answer that question, how I would answer that question, uh, if that person still needs help, pray for them. Uh, at a distance, maybe you can drop some resources to their, a family member or something like that. Hey, look, you know, I'm just, just concerned about, you know, your brother, your sister. Um, here's, some, here's some resources. Just know that I'm praying. And then you have to step away. Mm-hmm. We're not their savior. And maybe that's why the relationship wasn't working, because you can't be someone's savior and their spouse or at the same time doesn't work that way yeah it's true there's only one savior father (laughs) all right three more should we be praying for someone to not get the abortion or should we be praying for all the circumstances that have made women consider such action why not pray for them all (laughs) uh uh, yes we should be praying specifically and and um i know i'm in in a, in a couple of young adult uh, groups where sometimes they'll, 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 they'll post that. They'll say, hey, you know, pray for this person. I spoke to her, she's thinking of having it. Yeah, we need to stop what we're doing to pray. Um, specifically, uh, generally, um, I would challenge people, you know, like to go uh, and participate in a 40 days for life, go and pray in front of an abortion clinic, pray for the women to be an, an, an instrument of God's love and peace in a very dark place. Um, but then pray for all those other circumstances because yeah, I mean like people don't just make a decision five minutes before they walk into a clinic. Yo, it's complicated. The world is hard. It's almost like there's so many things against you 
And, and then like all of a sudden, all this weight is, is, is put on you because of, of, of a pregnancy. It's like, you know, there's, there's gotta be a better way. And again, the group uh, I helped to found, Corazon Puro, we try to answer those questions because there's a lot of things, you know, there's our own history. There's, there's, there's the baggage that we carry from our own families, our own wounds, our own traumas. Like who's talking about that? Who's, who's, who's going to the women and the men who need help with that? And so it's, we're trying a little bit in Corazon Puro to address some of those things, but yes, that needs prayer as well. And we need to be about the whole solution, not just a decision made on a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. but the whole, whole solution that's that's pro-life and this is what we need to be about totally all right two more what are some ways to be in solidarity with the poor i know in la we have the franciscans of the poor of jesus christ so we go to skid row on tuesdays if anybody's open but father what are some other ways to be in solidarity with the poor well i would answer along the lines of saint francis de sales um, you know, what's your state in life? Like, look, if you are a, a married man with four kids, you're not called to be in solidarity with the poor the same way as the Franciscans of the poor are, okay? You, you, you can't give away all your things. You shouldn't, you know, but maybe we can simplify our lives. Maybe, maybe we can uh, kind of like go through and buy the things that you need instead of buying the things that you want is one way of being in solidarity with the poor. Instead of just like saying, mm, I want a Burger King today, like offer that up, save that whatever $10, give it to a, a worthy charity and then, you know, have a meal at home. You know, like we, we waste so many things. Maybe do like a little inventory about yourself, um, and 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 ask you know like how can I how can I live more simply, how can I how can I um, offer up, you know this 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 thing. When, I remember one time we were um, in Manhattan at the Catholic Underground, and uh, and and I said, hey look man, how much how much money do you guys spend on a night out, concert, drinks, and everything? Man, that's easy, easy like two hundred fifty dollars a night out, you know. You know, help us out. You know, we need it. And like, man, there's like tons of people started giving money. It's like, you know, it was, when you think about it like that, like, you know, what if you didn't go out on Saturday and you gave what you would have spent on a Saturday night to a, to to someone who's helping the poor? Like, I think those are ways that that people who are you know in the world um, can be in solidarity with the poor. Uh, can you live with the poor? Can you spend time with the poor? Can you be with the poor just because they're good? Um, one of the brothers recently said, serve the poor, uh, especially if this is the brother that said this, he was, he was raw. He said, if you are so hung up on liturgical things and mm -hmm. things have to be a certain way, go serve the poor. Mm -hmm. Go serve the poor, be not because they need you, but because they're better than you. I was like, woo, drop the mic, brother. That's a, that's a strong word. Um, but like, this is kind of like a way of seeing our service with the poor. And it, and it also informs the other ways that we worship. So um, those are some ways. Uh, maybe you're in a time in your life where you can be more in solidarity with the poor. Hey, amen. Um, uh, read about St. Francis. He, he, ma he made it a thing. Maybe you're called to be a missionary for a little bit, you know, do it. Uh, if, this is, if this is the time you have in your life to do it, uh, maybe God is calling you to that. Um, but that's a good question. And, um, uh, but seek wise counsel from someone who would really challenge you to be in solidarity with the poor. Go help out the missionaries at charity and ask them for advice and they'll tell you straight, man. They will tell you what's up is what I would say to that. I love what Father said about serving, especially because it's like, how do you remain pious, but with humility, you know what I mean? And that's one way. Okay, Father, last one. How do you embrace your humanity? <sighs> well, yeah. Um, it's a big one, I know. <laughs> So if by humanity, we mean our, our fallen nature, our tendency to sin, mm -hmm. um, 
like sometimes people are just like, ah, oh, you know, like I, I did it again, you know, like going to confession, Father, and um, doing the same things, you know, and like sometimes we call that our humanity, um, and uh, and and really that is not our identity. Um, our identity is as sons and daughters of God, beloved of the Father. And, um, and sometimes we make those things our identity. So how do you embrace your humanity is know that our tendency to sin is a reality that needs to be informed with the radical mercy of our Lord. Mm-hmm. His love is more proximate to us than even our very sins. Now that said, it doesn't mean that you just do whatever you want to do because that's presumption. Like, cause, cause he can forgive you. No, don't presume work on it. Um, but, uh, but embrace the process, right? Like the 76ers, you know, embrace the process. Holiness isn't an event. It's a process. It's a process of learning how to be learning your need for God. And sometimes those, those, those struggles with sin, uh, God is allowing precisely because we need to learn how to depend on him because that's the only way because if we had it all together, we wouldn't turn to him. So like this, this sin is actually an, a, an opportunity for me to grow closer to him and to see it like that, like, you know, like, ah, uh, this struggle is what it is, but, but I need to pray to break this cycle of sin. And so our humanity in and of itself is, is inherently good. And so embracing your humanity is, is embracing the reality that you are beloved by the almighty, all-powerful, omniscient God. What a radical statement. Your humanity is that you're, you're meant to be greater than the angels. Your humanity is, is that your body is meant to be glorified. And even if through our fallen nature, so many things are wrong, there is way more that is right about your humanity is how I would answer that question. Yeah, thank you. We are, yeah, thank you, Father, for all of this. And thank you, everyone, for watching. It's a beautiful time together to talk about justice. And if you guys want to watch it, it's recorded on Facebook, but also our new YouTube channel, Love and Responsibility LA, has all of our talks and all of our series. Um, So please check it out. Also, we have St. Picas on Friday. If you guys are in L.A., um, it's at San Gabriel Mission with the Franciscans of the Poor and also the Vocation Office. We have five priests coming for confessions. All you young adults, just come be with Jesus together. Um, Yeah, it's time. It's time to gather again. Um, So, Father, thank you so much. How can people reach you? People want to know, is there mission trips or um, learn more about Corazon Puro? Like, how do they do this? Uh, Check Instagram, um, my Instagram handle is orale cp, O-R-A-L-E-C-P. Um, and, uh, and also there's the Corazon Puro NYC, that's our official Instagram handle, or just email info at corazonpuro.org. Um, yeah, and we have a mission trip coming down to South Texas to the border. We hope to, to serve uh, on both sides of the border. Uh, with everything that's going on on the border these days. And uh, we hope to also head down to Central America. Hopefully, you know, some things will open up, but that's that's all this summer. So hit us up if you're interested uh, because um, yes, justice through the lens of love and responsibility, we're trying to put it in action. Uh, but yeah, through Instagram is probably the best way. Uh, you can also check out Shameless Plug. Uh, for those of you Spanish speakers, I wrote a book uh, in Spanish called Aprendiendo a Amar con Juan Pablo II. It's basically kind of like my uh, synthesis summary of John Paul II's uh, anthropology in Spanish. So sorry for those uh, English only speakers. Um, and, uh, and if you don't laugh when you read it, you get your money back, okay? So just let me know if you don't laugh. You read it, you didn't wow. laugh. Father, you better be a man of your word on that. <laughs> All right, everybody, and make sure you join us. May 17th, we're starting our book study. Um, It was awesome. We did Men, Women, the Mystery of Love before with Edward Suri and his wife. That was awesome. And one of our friends actually is going to make it in Spanish. So another little plug. So that would be cool. Um, But the, the new book study is May 17th, Love and Responsibility. You guys, it is intense. 
but it's going to be great to have a little Socratic seminar, do it with small groups, like just pick each other's minds and really get into this truth. We're going to change and grow together. So please sign up on Linktree, go to Instagram or Facebook. You can sign up on there. Um, it has all different days through the week. There will be small groups. We have India. We have a group um, in Philippines. It's going to be awesome. So um, please join us for that. And Father, um, we are so blessed to have you. I pray that we can talk again. I pray that there will be a Catholic underground here, that revival in LA will happen, and that we will really live out justice um, through love and responsibility. So everybody who's watching, thank you so much. Until next time, don't forget to love responsibly. Bye, guys. <laughs>